All right, welcome back everybody to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight, we are going to continue looking at a sutta that we started last week. The sutta is in the middle-length discourses of the Buddha. We are looking at sutta number 44, which is the shorter series of questions and answers. We spent three weeks a while ago uh, doing the longer, the Maha discourse on questions and answers. And now we're looking at the shorter version. And I introduced this last week. And what I think is so interesting about this sutta is that the, the main person doing the teaching is actually a bhikshuni, is a nun. But what's even more interesting than that, than what's even more interesting than having a nun be the primary uh, you know, wisdom giver, what's even more interesting is that the person that she's being questioned by is her former husband. So they used to be married, but they both got into the Dharma, they both got into Buddhism, and she wound up leaving home, leaving her husband, and becoming a nun. But her husband continued to sort of support her and be one of her primary donors. And in this sutta, uh, Visakkaha, the husband, has gone to Dhammadina, the bhikshu, or bhikshuni, sorry, with a series of questions. And that's what this sutra is all about, is the husband, Visakka, asking his former wife, Dhammadina, all of these questions. And so, you know, we already did pretty much the first half of this, I would say, where uh, Visaka asked about, well, Visaka asked primarily, he began by asking about the self, identity. And the question is, like, what is identity or what is the self in that way? And uh, Dhammadina points to the aggregates. And then we dealt with having the view of a self. And then the Noble Eightfold Path, a little section on Samadhi. And then the last thing we talked about last week were samskara, our conditioning or our habits in that way. And there were different types of conditioning, bodily conditioning, vocal conditioning and mental conditioning. And that brings us to where we're going to start tonight, which is at the bottom of page 399, if you happen to have this version. And the question is, the question we're going to start with tonight is, Visaka asks, Lady, how does the attainment of the cessation of perception and feeling come to be. So this is, of course, a very, very technical topic. And I want to remind you, we're kind of getting towards the end of the sutta. So things are getting a little more technical, a little more advanced in that way. And so let's start by kind of just looking at what the question is. So Visaka has asked about the Samya Vedana Nirodha Samapati. So the Samapati is the attainment. This is like the accomplishment, the attainment. You've made it, you did it. So that's a Samapati attaining. And Visaka has asked, how does the attaining, the obtaining of the Nirodha, the cessation of Samya and Vedana, the cessation of perception and sensations or feelings. So the question is about this very, very particular state of meditation. It's one of the deepest states of meditation you could get in. And it's so deep that 
it leads to and results in no more, so the cessation of perception and sensations, like sens sensory stimuli, sensory sensations. So if you were here a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, I'm not sure exactly when, but when we did the, the longer series of questions and answers, this topic came up in that sutta as well. But I want to remind you that in that sutta, sutta number 43, the question or one of the questions regarding the cessation of perception and feeling, one of the questions was, what's the difference between somebody who has attained the cessation of perception and feeling and a corpse? <laughs> and I use that question, like, what's the difference between them? I use that to point at how in the early Buddhist tradition, as represented by a sutta like this, it would seem that when they're asking the question about what's the difference between somebody in this nirodha and a corpse, it would seem to me that they're asking that question because from all appearances, the person's dead. <laughs> That's what it would seem like they're asking or why they're asking that. So this is this, again, this really deep state of meditation. And it reaches this point where two aspects of the mind shut off and are no longer functioning. And those two aspects of the mind are samya and vedana, so perception and feeling or sensation. And we want to understand that when it comes to this Buddhist idea of samya, of perception, we want to remember, let me, let me grab this one tonight. So I often use this optical illusion and the idea here is, is that you may be perceiving two faces, or you might be perceiving some sort of glass or candlestick in the middle. And what I want you to think about is how some of you might be perceiving faces while some of you, some other of you, might be perceiving what's in the middle. And what this kind of points to from a Buddhist point of view is that perception is not just seeing what is there to be seen. It's very much about the perceiver in that way. Now, let's go a little deeper with this idea of samya, so I want to remind you that samya is one of the five aggregates. So it's one of the constituent elements of a sentient being, along with the physical matter of the sensory organs, and along with the vedana, the sensations that are arising from the body and the ears and the eyes and the nose and the tongue and the brain and the mind. Samya, the third of the aggregates, what we want to understand about Samya is that Samya, what is being translated as perception, Samya works right alongside of what is called Vijnana, which is the fifth aggregate, consciousness. And actually the, the root the, the root word of both of those, samnya and vijnana. The root of both of those words is jnana, knowledge. They are both forms of knowledge acquisition, if you will. 
But Samya, S A M, Sam, Samya is a form of associative thinking. And what Samya is, it's the function of mind that groups things together into a package or into a thing. So it's about gathering together. So for example, over here on my screen here, there's a little bird. So if you're perceiving Samya, if you're perceiving a bird, your mind, the mind, is noticing that there's what looks like a wing and another wing and a little tail and a little beak. And Samya is about taking those different parts and holding them as the bird. So if you're perceiving a bird, it's because you have grouped those together into an object, which is just like grouping all of this together into a face and grouping all of this together into a face. So Samya is about grouping things together into an object. Vi jnana, vinyana or consciousness is literally a divided, uh, V means division. So it's divided knowledge acquisition. What does divided knowledge acquisition mean? Well, vinyana is about separating this object from that object. So notice that one part of the mind is grouping things together into holes, and another part of the mind is separating those holes from other holes. And then what thinking is, or kind of an aspect of consciousness, is this kind of simultaneous grouping things together and separating them from other things. By the way, this process of samnya and vijnana, it also goes for perceiving yourself in terms of hand, hand, Michael. Michael is not <laughs> that. <laughs> So the Samya part of my mind is grouping all of this into me. And now I'm looking out at all of you and my mind is being like, oh, that's you and that's you and that's you. And then the Vijnana part of my mind is saying, and this is not that. And that person is not that person is not that person is not that person. So we want to begin to notice these two parts of our mind in that way. One part is grouping and one part is dividing. Now let's return quickly to the second aggregate, Vedana. So Vedana is about this kind of, well, what I always want to remind everybody Vedana, even though it is translated as feeling or sensation, and it is about the feelings or the sensations that you're having from what you're seeing or from what you're hearing or from what you're smelling or tasting or touching or thinking about. But Vedana, it's important to remember that Vedana is also about whether you want more of that sensation or less of that sensation. And what I mean by that is, is, is it pleasant and you want more and you want it to last? Or is it painful or unpleasant and you want it to go away as quickly as possible? So let's remember that Vedana is not just the sensation, it's about how you're reacting to the sensation in terms of it being positive or negative. So now let's put all of that together and let's talk about nirodha. So this word nirodha, talk about a 
technical Buddhist term. So the first thing that you need to know about Nirodha is that it literally, like literally the word Nirudha, it means a, a, like a setting down or a laying down, a putting down. But in the world of Buddhism, they it usually transited as cessation. And the kind of the preferred analogy is a fire that has been put out. That's nirodha. That's cessation. It's no longer active. Now, in the world of Buddhism, you have just the idea of nirodha. But then you also have some very specific types of nirodha. In other words, there is a general idea of cessation, but then there's these like specific forms of it. And so this is the particular cessation of samya and vedana. If we think about that for a moment, the cessation of perception and feeling or sensation. The idea, of course, is I want you to notice again that the mind has this tendency to perceive. And again, what we're calling perception is this kind of grouping together into cognizable, understandable things right? Let's also remember, you know, the mind, the mind is a meaning maker. It loves making meaning. It, it doesn't, it's actually not really usually comfortable when it doesn't know in that way. So my point is, is that as soon as I show you this, the mind is working to try to figure it out. To, is working to perceive. And so what we want to kind of notice is a strain or like a stress that's involved in perceiving. And at this point, I want to remind you, perceiving is not just seeing what's there to be seen. Perceiving is an active, it's active on your part. It, I know that the common idea is that it's passive. You're just perceiving. But in Buddhism, it's a very active thing where your mind is actively grouping these together into perceivable objects or actively grouping this together into one perceivable object. But now check this out. So using this, let's just keep using this as an example. All right. And Let's do the game. I always like to play this game where there's like a knock at the door and you go to your little peephole and you see this. And what I want you to think about, and this is my hypothetical scenario. Let's say it's you and a friend and you're both hanging out at your house and there's that knock at the door and you both go up to the peephole and look through and your friend sees this and your friend says, woohoo, yay, let's open the door. But I go, wait a minute, let me see first. And I look and I see this and I go, no, 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 no. Let's not answer. Let's not open the door. Why not? <laughs> and so what I want you to notice is that my friend had a positive vedana, a positive reaction to what was seen through the people and was excited and wanted to open the door because my friend saw a champagne glass and my friend loves champagne. So 
when he saw a champagne glass, he got all excited and wanted to open the door. But I have like social anxiety. And when I look through the peephole, I saw two people. And I don't want to let two strangers in my house. That would make me uncomfortable. So I had a negative reaction, a negative Vedana to what I saw. What I'm setting up here, if you, if you didn't notice it already, is I'm setting up the relationship between perception and feeling. In other words, your feelings about things like, ooh, or mmm, those feelings are about your perception. And oh, and by the way, I haven't mentioned this in the last couple of minutes. We're not just talking about visual perception, of course. You might hear a sound and one person might hear the sound and be delighted by it. And another person might hear the same exact sound, but be saddened by it. But that's because my friend heard it as laughter and I heard it as crying. So my perception of what I heard influenced the way I felt about it. But let's also remember though, perception, that's on you. That was part one of this lesson, which is that we think perceiving is just passive seeing or hearing or smelling, tasting, touching, or thinking about what's there to be heard. But if you notice with all of my examples, perception is an active thing on your part. And so now if we start looking at perception and its relationship to Vedana, or sensations, we can kind of start to see how we are very much kind of in charge of our own emotional state. But we kind of forget that a lot. And we sort of, um, as, as I like to put it, we, we outsource our happiness and we just sort of put it in the hands of objects in that way. But if we understood this relationship between Samya and Vedana, and we understood that we are the perceiver in that sense, then we're also sort of the one dictating our reactions in that way. All of this has been to try to show you how it is that Samya and Vedana, perception and feeling, I wanted to show you how they're a little tricky. And what I mean is, is that, oh, and by the way, I will do this also just to reinforce something. I know that when I use this one, there's this toggling between the faces and the candle or the uh, whatever this is for you. And I know that this can be a little tricky because it's an optical illusion but that's when i would want to remind you about this one what are you perceiving i'm perceiving uh i'm gonna perceive my vase right so this is a really kind of interesting little vase i don't know what you're perceiving you might be perceiving a scarf, right? Or maybe sanitary paper, right? Toilet paper. But my point is, is that I know that this is an optical illusion, but guess what? This is an optical illusion as well. In terms of the mind that is locked in to thinking that this is just a roll of toilet paper and there's just a roll of toilet paper there to be seen. That's the idea that perception is passive and that, oh, Michael's holding up a roll of toilet paper and therefore I see a roll of toilet paper. Versus understanding that the perception is on you in that way. So 
It's not just optical illusions. It's all of this. Now, again, what I wanted to do was complicate perception and vedana. I wanted to show their intimate relationship. And basically, I wanted to complicate it so that when we start in right now, when we start talking about bringing the both of those things to cessation, like basically getting rid of them, I want you to understand like, why we might want to do that. So let's start to talk about Nirodha, like in general. So the other thing about Nirodha that you should keep in mind, there's basically like temporary cessation, meaning like, uh, let's take a, um, you know, just take a, a simple emotion like anger, and the idea is, is that I could be, you know, angry, but if I got into a meditative state, calmed down, and basically kind of took everything off my mind, <laughs> I could bring that anger to cessation, where I just was deep in a meditative state, and I was just no longer angry. That would be nirodha of that particular dharma or that particular sensation or that particular emotion. But then I come out of meditation and I see something and it makes me angry. Whoop! Anger's back. So in other words, a nirodha could be temporary, momentary, or within the world of Buddhism, you could eventually reach a state where the cessation of an emotion like anger has been completely ceased. And so much so, it doesn't come back. Now, if you could successfully bring to Nirodha the three poisons of greed, anger, and delusion, and if you brought them to a state of cessation and it stuck, like those three things never rose back up, that particular state of nirodha is what they call nirvana in the early Buddhist tradition. So often nirodha and nirvana are synonymous. But the thing that I would like you to understand is that nirvana is kind of permanent in that sense of it's locked in, whereas Nirodha could be there and then things could come back. So now let's put all of that together and talk about the attainment of the cessation of perception and feeling. Now, I want to remind you what I reminded you of earlier, which is that for the <clears throat> for the early Buddhist tradition, somebody who is in who has attained the state of the cessation of perception and feeling, for all intents and purposes, they're dead. Meaning they are displaying all the signs of not being alive. They're not breathing. There's no detectable heart rate. There is no signs of movement. There is just total stillness. Now, if you go back and read Sutta number 43, you can find out about that life force samskara that is actually keeping the meditator alive while they're in this state. And it's that that eventually brings them out of such a state. But why would you want to even do this? Right? Why would you want to achieve such a state of the cessation of perceiving and feeling? Right? That sounds a little, I don't know, that sounds a bit austere or a bit rough in that way. Well, it has a lot to do with the last topic that we talked about last week, samskara, conditioning. And what it is, 
is that, you know, Buddhism is a deep, deep psychological tradition. And one thing that the Buddha seems to have figured out, it's that we are habituated, conditioned beings. And it's not just humans, of course. Even the gods are conditioned. Animals are conditioned. All sentient beings are habituated, conditioned things in that way. And from a Buddhist point of view, let's let's say, let's just stick with anger. I've already mentioned it. So let's say that you're somebody that gets, you know, very angry about things. I don't know what it is, whatever it is that maybe you get angry about, right? So I want you to think about this sort of cycle, right? This kind of cyclical process of basically kind of constantly reinforcing that anger in a way, doing things and acting in ways that then kind of perpetuate the state of anger. Well, basically that's the idea for, you know, basically for Buddhism is that samsara, cyclical existence, it's about continuing to reinforce habits. And the thing about it is, is it really doesn't matter what it is, you know, whether it's being quick to anger or quick to desire or quick to pride or whatever it is, but this kind of like reinforcing behavior, what the Buddha seems to have realized and what the Buddhist tradition teaches is that in order to break the cycle of habitual reconditioning, you have to stop. You have to pause for a moment and notice, oh, I'm angry. Now, my point, let me let me make this super, super clear. Let's say you're driving and let's say somebody cuts you off and that makes you angry. Understandable. It's understandable that that might make you angry, right? But what we want to notice is, is that the, the scenario, the situation, it could go like this. The person cuts me off. I get angry and I, uh, I lay into my horn, right? So I'm really letting that person know how angry I am, right? And then I see the person give me the finger in the, in the I honk at them and then they give me the finger. They cut me off though. Oh, now it's on. So now I'm driving right up against their tail, right? And I'm like, you're gonna, I'm gonna show you how angry I am. And my point is, is that upon the initial onset of the anger, what we did was act on the anger. We acted upon it and we honked our horn and then we got more angry. And then we started driving really close to the guy's bumper. Now, if the person had cut us off and we had noticed that that made us angry, but we stopped. And rather than acting on the anger, we noticed that we were angry. As simple as it is, and I say this all the time, I know it seems so simple, but the practice of Buddhism is the stopping and the noticing versus just acting on it. That's actually the practice is stopping yourself. It's difficult because we're up against our conditioning. We're up against deep, deep habits. But the practice is to stop and notice this, this whole being cut off situation has made me angry. Now, if you want bonus points, like you want to go for the bonus round, ask yourself why. 
why did this person cutting me off make me angry? Like, can you look down and investigate where the anger's coming from? Maybe, just, just for example, maybe you were late for an appointment. Just hear me out on this. Hear me out on this hypothetical scenario. You're late for an appointment. Somebody cuts you off. And there's this feeling that this person cutting me off is going to make me late for my appointment. And so I'm angry at them because they're going to make me late. But if you wanted like a lot of bonus points, you could look deep down underneath that anger about this person making me late and actually ask yourself, why do I feel like I need to be on time? Oh, I'm trying to uphold a reputation of being punctual and on time. And this person is risking my good reputation of being on time. But what you will start to notice is that your anger doesn't actually have anything to do with this person who cuts you off. You're angry at about a bunch of other things or a bunch of other hypothetical possibilities about what people might think of you or whatever, whatever, whatever. And my point is, is that the first step is the stopping and noticing that this has made me angry. The next step is looking underneath that and asking, why is this making me angry? And in the process of doing this, the anger might just unravel. You might realize that you're being silly, being angry, and that it was actually now me obsessing about this person who cut me off. And like, you know, maybe I followed them, right? I got off, I got off the freeway and I like followed them, right? Who's making me late now? <laughs> I am. <laughs> right? Through my obs angry obsession with this person that cut me off. My point again is that the normal mode is just to react and react and react. This is what we do all the time. The practice again is to stop and notice these things. And then again, if, if we have it in us, we want to ask that question of where's it coming from? Okay. So I say all of that to show the, the tricky, tricky thing about conditioning, that we're kind of up against our own conditioning in that way, where I'm very prone to anger. And there's a way in which if I don't stop at some point, it's just going to kind of keep cyclically building on itself. So from a Buddhist point of view, what the Buddhists, the Buddhists have recognized is that it's important to basically calm the mind down. And in the early Buddhist tradition, this isn't entirely true of all Buddhist traditions, but in the early Buddhist tradition, the meditation process it was all about getting to this point, the point where you could shut off perception and feeling or sensation. And again, why would you want to shut these off? Because from a, from a kind of basic Buddhist point of view, the mind needs to rest. The mind needs to stop reinforcing these things. And so by taking a perception break and a reaction break, meaning sensations, Vedana, a Vedana break, by taking a break from reacting and perceiving, the mind basically, mm, I mean, don't take this too seriously, but the mind kind of resets, basically. Just like kind of turning the computer back, you know, turning it off, turning it back on. And so my point is, 
is that there's a lot of, um, well, especially nowadays, like in the kind of more psychedelic uh, journeying communities that I'm familiar with, there's a lot of talk of ego death or having these kind of disassociative experiences where you are completely kind of gone for a moment. The value of these experiences, it's not actually the time that you spend not perceiving and not feeling in that way, because ultimately that's gonna be a state of suspended animation for you. The important part about it is the reintegrating process. And what I mean is, is that if you have taken a break from perceiving and reacting for a while, then with fresh eyes, you can see things anew and you can react differently to them. This is the psychology that Buddhism is working with, the psychology of habituation and techniques for disengaging habituation in that way. Okay, any questions before we dive deeper into the text? That was a long, long treatment of the samapati, the attainment of this Narodha. Everybody? Cool. So with all of that in mind about this, the question that Visaka had was, lady, how does this attainment of the cessation of perception of feeling come to be? Let's say I sold you on this. Let's say you were like, ooh, sign me up. I want to take a break from perceiving and feeling for a moment. How would I do that? Well, Dhammadina says, friend Visaka. When a meditator or a practitioner, a bhikkhu, when a bhikkhu is attaining the cessation of perception and feeling, it doesn't occur to them, I shall attain the perception of the cessation of perception and feeling. It doesn't occur to them, I am attaining the cessation of perception and feeling. It doesn't occur to them, I've attained the cessation of perception and feeling. But rather, the mind has been previously developed in such a way that it leads to that state. So this is a long one. So that's a really interesting, subtle comment on how you get into this. You can't get into it by willing it, by saying, I will, I'm going to get into that state tonight. So you can't do it willingly in that way, nor would you be able to say, I'm in it. And that kind of makes sense if I just describe this as a state of basically suspended animation close to being a corpse. It should make sense then that there's no, I did it. I'm I'm in the cessation of perception and feeling. It that doesn't make any sense because that would be a feeling. That would be a vedana. That would be a perception that I'm in it. <laughs> so you can't choose to get into it. You wouldn't know it if you're in it. And the bhikkhu also doesn't claim that I've attained it. Like past tense. Rather, as it says, the mind has previously been developed in such a way that it leads to that state. Basically, what we're talking about is that there's a lot of preparatory work that goes into this. That preparatory work is not just on the cushion. It's not just meditative preparatory work. It's morality work, the shila work. So we're working on, you know, following the precepts, being moral. That's a big part of it. And of course, the 
the practice in that way. But it sounds to me like Damadina is saying that you do all of this preliminary work and then it kind of happens, but you can't will it to happen. You wouldn't know if it was happening. And there's even a way that the ego identity doesn't claim it afterwards in that way. And by the way, all of that, that language that we just walked through in terms of not being able to really will it, you wouldn't know it if you were in it type of thing. This is all the language of, of attainments or samapati. And ultimately, as I understand it, the way this, this would have worked is you would meditate, you would have basically like um, that kind of period of suspended animation. You'd come out of it, and we haven't really talked about all of that yet, but you'd come out of it. And basically, you'd go to your, your teacher or your guru, and you'd ba basically say, this is how my meditation went. And then they would say, oh, you attain the state of neither perception nor feeling. So it wouldn't be that the meditator is like, aha, I did it. It would be the guru saying, no, you attained it in that way. That's how I understand that traditionally this has happened. So, all right. So that's how you get into it is just a lot of preparatory work and allowing the kind of karma to unfold in that sense. The next question is, lady, when a bhikkhu is attaining the cessation of perception and feeling, which states cease first? The bodily samskara, the verbal samskara, or the mental samskara? And this, of course, is what relates this section to the previous section on the three kinds of samskara. So that, that's why we talked about that. Now we're talking about this. And again, the question is, when you get into this particular attainment, when you get into this nirodha, what ceases first? Body, speech, or mind? And Dhammadina says, friend Visakka. When a bhikkhu is attaining the cessation of perception and feeling, first, the verbal samskara ceases, then the bodily samskara, then finally the mental samskara. Lady, how does the emergence from the attainment of the cessation of perception and feeling come to be? So how do you get out of this meditation? Friend Visakka, when a bhikkhu is emerging from the attainment of the cessation of perception and feeling, it doesn't occur to them, I shall emerge from the attainment of cessation and perception and feeling. Or it doesn't occur to them that I am in the process of emerging from the attainment of cessation of perception and feeling. And it doesn't occur to them, I've emerged from the attainment of the cessation of perception and feeling. But rather, the mind has previously been developed in such a way that it leads to that state. This is a, night, a topic that we did talk about last week and, and maybe even when we did the sutta number 43. But it's this interesting idea that, that when one sort of moves into these deep meditative states, there's a way in which you kind of have to almost set an internal alarm clock. Almost like when you go to sleep and you're like, you know what, I'm going to get up at eight o'clock. And then you fall asleep and some people have that ability to just kind of get up at eight o'clock. Well, that's the way it's described of how you get out of this is that when you're in it, because there's no mental activity going on, you can't will yourself out of it in that way. So there has to be this kind of prior karmic determination. So, Also regarding this particular meditative state, he says, lady, 
When a bhikkhu is emerging from the attainment of the cessation of perception and feeling, which states arise first? Bodily samskara, verbal samskara, or mental samskara? Friend Visakka. When a bhikkhu is emerging from the attainment of the cessation of perception and feeling, first, the mental conditioning comes back online, then the bodily conditioning comes back online, then the verbal formations come back online. Or first the mental, then the body, then the verbal formations come back online. Another question, lady. When a bhikkhu has emerged from the attainment of the cessation of perception and feeling, how many kinds of contact are there? Or how many times of contact touch them? Friend Visaka, when a bhikkhu has emerged from the attainment of the cessation of perception and feeling, three kinds of contact touch them. Voidness or shun shunyata contact, characteristicless or signless contact, and desireless contact. So for me, one of the most interesting things about this particular sutta is that this right here, this little part, so these three things, this shunyata, this animita, and this apranihita, I think it is. I think that's how you say the desirelessness. But these three things, emptiness, characteristiclessness, and desirelessness, or aimlessness, or wishlessness, these three are what are known as the three doors of liberation, and they are a foundational part of Mahayana Buddhism. You find shunyata, emptiness, you find it all throughout the Pali Canon. It's a part of the, the discourse. The idea of characteristiclessness, it's another idea that you find all throughout the Pali Canon. And even this idea of wishlessness is an idea that you find in the canon, but it's actually kind of rare to find them grouped together in the Pali canon. Again, these three become a foundational teaching of the Bodhisattva path and the Mahayana. And I find it very interesting that it appears in this sutta with our nun Dhammadina. So, when someone is coming out of this nirodha, this state of the cessation of perception and feeling, they initially have these three sparsha, three contacts. And they are the contact of emptiness, characteristiclessness, and wishlessness. Now, I won't go too deep into these because this would be a whole other Dharma talk. But I want to mention really quickly the third of those. Emptiness, we talk about all the time. Characteristiclessness, I talk about all the time. So there's plenty of Dharma doors where we've talked about those. But the last of these, it's really interesting. And I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to explain it the way that I understand it in the Bodhisattva tradition. And what it is, is when they're talking about, so that the, the word, it's translated as either wishlessness or desirelessness or aim, aimlessness. And the very, the particular connotation that this has in the Bodhisattva path it's about not having a desire for a preferable rebirth.
Now, if you're if you're the type of person that doesn't believe in reincarnation anyways, like you don't think you're going to be reborn in a body, if if that's you, then you might be thinking I've already achieved the state of wishlessness. Right? You you might be thinking I don't I don't even believe in reincarnation, so I have no desire to be reborn as a god or what have you. But let's remember that if you don't believe in reincarnation, then what we're talking about is 10 years from now. And whether you have some deep-seated desire to be in a bigger house, making more money, driving a better car, whatever it is, if you have dreams of 10 years from now being in a better life situation, that is no different than praying for a better rebirth. It's exactly the same thing. The idea, of course, is that if we put it back in the context of rebirth, what we want to keep in mind, at least from a, like, well, we could even understand it from this point of view. Somebody coming out of this meditation, this cessation of perception and feeling, they are in deep contact with the emptiness of all things, they are in deep contact with the characteristiclessness of all things, and coming out of this meditation, they no longer have any desires for some better rebirth. But this would be coming not from apathy, it would be coming from the wisdom that coming out of that cessation of perception and feeling, it would be from the realization that there is no self to be reborn. And so understanding that the desire for such a rebirth is delusional in that way. So that would be my quick description of these three. Questions, comments, ideas about anything that we've talked about so far? Yeah, Lane. Oh, let's see. Don't know. Oh, there you are. Oh, it happened. I saw it. Was that you, Noe? Let's see. Got it. Yeah. Thank you, Noe. Um, Michael, what? What's the subtle difference between perhaps hoping for a better rebirth in 10 years and being practical in like saving for retirement? Because I know I'm not going to be able to work my whole life or I might have medical issues or whatever. Could you parse that a little bit for me? Absolutely. It's a really great question. Really important question. So there's a couple of different ways that I could definitely answer that. Let's, well, let me, let me give you all the options in that way. <clears throat> so if, if I were a monk teaching monastics, or if I was really sticking to this, there would definitely be a, a there would basically be a teaching about renunciation. I just have to say it, that there would be this sort of a recognition, you know, it's it's what they say. In the sutras, they say, you know, the householder's life, the householder's life is hard and dusty. The homeless life, you're free as a bird. <laughs> and so we let's just keep that in mind. But regarding householders and being practical and all of that, there's another couple of ways that I could I could approach it. The kind of the middle road kind of a way, the real kind of basic way that I could comment on that, I don't know about answer it, comment, it would be about a sort of making plans, being responsible, but also then not being stuck on that being the case 
so that if things don't work out, we're, we're not as affected in that way. So there's that. There's also, it's probably the answer that I wind up giving the most. And since that, since we've done, you know, we're pretty deep into this Dharma talk. So I feel like I can, I can say this now. It has a lot to do with this sort of teaching of no self that we keep talking about. And what it is, is that if I were answering your, your question, Lane, from a kind of bodhisattva point of view, the realization about no self, the realization a bodhisattva has is that there is going to be, though, a being that thinks it's Lane in the future. <laughs> and so out of compassion and kindness for that being, I'm going to set up a really nice situation for that Lane and she's going to love it. And so it's a way of kind of being compassionate towards our future selves, but without that kind of hoping and desperation for the idea of like, I'm going to be so happy when that happens. And on that note, Lane, I just want to remind you that a really kind of subtle but important teaching, it's about how future, certain kinds of future-oriented thinking in that way, they can really take us out of this precious present moment in that way. And so I wouldn't you know, want to completely abandon responsibility and future-oriented thinking? Of course not. But there's sort of these, like, you know, really wise recommendations for how to deal with that. Yeah? Oh, good. Yeah. Just a couple of thoughts. Again, it's a really, really important question that I don't ever, you know, want to just gloss over or dismiss in, in some sort of bypassing way. Not at all. So thank you. Cool. All right. Just one more question regarding this, uh, this uh, Nirodha situation. The last question regarding it is, Lady, when a bhikkhu has emerged from the attainment of the cessation of perception and feeling, to what does the mind incline? To what does the mind incline? To what does it lean? To what does it tend? Friend Visakka, when a bhikkhu has emerged from the attainment of the cessation of perception and feeling, the mind inclines towards seclusion. It leans towards seclusion. It tends to seclusion. And on that note, I would want to remind you that this is an old, old Buddha Sutta that's geared towards monastics and that kind of more secluded life in that way. All right. Let's talk about Vedana. We've already talked a lot about it. So that's sensations or feelings, positive, negative, or neutral, right? And in fact, that's Visaka's question. Lady. How many kinds of Vedana are there? How many kinds of feelings are there? Friend Visakka, there's three kinds of feeling, pleasant, painful, and neither painful nor pleasant. But lady, what is a pleasant feeling? What is painful feeling? What is neither painful nor pleasurable feeling? Friend Visaka, whatever is felt bodily or mentally as pleasant and soothing is a pleasant feeling. Whatever is felt bodily or mentally as painful and hurting is a painful feeling. And whatever is felt bodily or mentally as neither soothing nor hurting is neither painful nor pleasant feeling. But lady, what is pleasant 
and what is painful in regard to pleasant feeling. What is painful and what is pleasant in regard to painful feeling. What is pleasant and what is painful in regard to neither painful nor pleasant feeling? Friend Visakka. Pleasant feeling is pleasant when it persists and painful when it changes. Painful feelings are painful when they persist and are pleasant when they change. Neither painful nor pleasant feelings are pleasant when there is knowledge of them and they are painful when there's no knowledge of them. Subtle, it, simple, but really subtle and worth thinking about in that way. And I say this because in order to really understand the Four Noble Truths, when the Buddha says, no, it's all dukkha, it's all suffering, we need to understand the painful aspect of pleasant feelings. The painful part of pleasant is that they don't last. And they kind of ultimately become a weird source of pain. And that's where we kind of start to look at pleasant feelings with a kind of suspicious eye. Like, wait a minute, you're not really pleasant. <laughs> you fooled me. And then also very interesting that neutral, neutral feelings, neither painful nor pleasant, are pleasant when it's acknowledged and painful when they're not acknowledged. Fascinating. Very interesting. All right. So we've come to a very interesting part of the sutta. I'm glad that we made it here. So this section, which is, we have two sections left. So this is the penultimate section. But this is a section on anushaya. Anushaya are what are being spoken about here. It's being translated as underlying tendencies. Anushaya can also be translated as proclivities or maybe even better, obsessions. But the point about the, these anushaya is that they are very deep proclivities or obsessions. What I, what I mean is, is that they are like running in the background. They're very like subconscious in that way. So the question is, lady, what anushaya, what underlying tendency underlies pleasant feelings? What underlying tendency underlies painful feeling? And what underlying tendency underlies neither painful nor pleasant feelings? So the three kinds of Vedana. Friend, the underlying tendency to raga, what they're tr translating as lust, but this attraction, the underlying tendency to attraction is what underlies pleasant feeling. So raga, this wanting, craving, attraction. Raga is what underlies pleasant feelings. The underlying tendency of dvesha, aversion, anger, bitterness, so the underlying tendency of aversion is what underlies painful feelings. And the underlying tendency, the anushaya that underlies, or the underlying tendency of ignorance is what underlies neither painful nor pleasant feelings. So you might have caught it. Those are the three poisons. We already talked about them once tonight. Greed, anger, delusion, or 
attraction, aversion, confusion, or ignorance. And those are the three anushaya that underlie pleasant, painful, and neutral feelings. Next series of questions regarding this. Lady, does the underlying tendency of lust or attraction underlie all pleasant feelings? Does the underlying tendency to aversion underlie all painful feelings? Does the underlying tendency of ignorance underlie all neither painful nor pleasant feelings? Friend, the underlying tendency of attraction or lust does not underlie all pleasant feelings. The underlying tendency to aversion does not underlie all painful feelings. And the underlying tendency to ignorance does not underlie all neither painful nor pleasant feelings. Lady, what should be abandoned in regard to pleasant feelings? What should be abandoned in regard to painful feelings? What should be abandoned in regard to neither painful nor pleasant feelings? Friend Visakka. The underlying tendency to attraction, to lust, should be abandoned in regard to pleasant feelings. The underlying tendency to aversion should be abandoned in regard to painful feelings. And the underlying tendency towards ignorance should be abandoned in regard to neither painful nor pleasant feelings. Pretty predictable Buddhist response, yeah. Lady, does the underlying tendency to lust or attraction have to be abandoned in order in regard to all pleasant feelings? Does the underlying tendency to aversion have to be abandoned in regard to all painful feelings? And does the underlying tendency to ignorance have to be abandoned in regard to all neither painful nor pleasant feelings? Friend Visaka, the underlying tendency to lust or attraction does not have to be abandoned in regard to all pleasant feelings. The underlying tendency to aversion does not have to be abandoned in regard to all painful feelings. And the underlying tendency to ignorance does not have to be abandoned in regard to all neither painful nor pleasant feelings. For example, so if you are wondering what she meant by that, here's the deal. Here, friend, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome, unvirtuous states, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. With that, they abandon lust, and the underlying tendency to lust does not underlie that. Here, Abiku considers thus. When shall I enter upon and abide in that base that the noble ones now enter upon and abide in? In one who thus generates a longing for the supreme liberations, grief arises with that longing as a condition. With that, they abandon aversion. And the underlying tendency to aversion does not underlie that. Here, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither painful nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. With that, they abandon ignorance and the underlying tendency to ignorance does not underlie that. Questions? For the way that the way that I read that with, you know, just to fill in a little bit of the gaps, the way that I read that is you know, we've had this discussion in the past, other Dharma doors, so I'll just sort of paraphrase it. But it's about how 
the desire to be liberated from suffering is not a problem. Meaning desire itself is not the problem. It's the object of that desire. And so if the object is sensual pleasures or what have you, then there's a problem. But if it's a jhana, for example, then there's no problem in that way. So that's kind of a gloss or a paraphrase of that section. If there's any last questions, otherwise we'll finish this up. Yeah, let's do it because we only have this one little section left and we have plenty of time. So this last is an idea that probably we might not have heard before. I definitely don't think I've ever done any. I've never mentioned this in a Dharma doors, I can tell you that. But the last of these is called Pati Bhaga. Pati Bhaga is being translated counterparts, opposites in a way, com complementaries in a way. So the question is, lady, what's the counterpart to pleasant feelings or pleasant Vedana, pleasant sensations? Well, friend Visaka, painful feelings are the counterpart to pleasant feelings, right? So this is kind of a, a yin and yang thing, right? So like, what's the opposite of that? So once again, what's the opposite of pleasant feelings? What's the counterpart? Well, friend, painful feelings are the counterpart to pleasant feelings. What's the counterpart of painful feelings? Pleasant feelings. <laughs> are the counterpart to painful feelings. What's the counterpart of neither painful nor pleasant feelings? Ignorance is the counterpart of neither painful nor pleasant feelings. What's the counterpart of ignorance then? True knowledge is the counterpart of ignorance. What's the counterpart of true knowledge? Deliverance is the counterpart of true knowledge. What's the counterpart to deliverance? Nirvana is the counterpart to deliverance. Well, lady, what's the counterpart to nirvana? Friend Visaka, you've pushed the line of questioning too far. You were not able to grasp the limit to questions. For the holy life, friend Visaka, is grounded upon nirvana. It culminates in nirvana. It ends in nirvana. If you wish, friend Visaka, go to the Blessed One and ask, and ask him about the meaning of this. As the Blessed One explains it to you, so you should remember it. And just to finish this up, well, then the lay householder, the lay follower of Isaka, having delighted and rejoiced in the Bhikkhuni Dhammadina's words, rose from his seat, and after paying homage to her, keeping her on his right side, he went to the Buddha. After paying homage to him, he sat down to one side and told the Buddha his entire conversation with the Bhikkhuni Dhammadina. When he finished speaking, the Blessed One told him this. The Bhikkhuni Dhammadina is wise, Visaka. The Bhikkhuni Dhammadina has great wisdom. If you had asked me the meaning of this, I would have explained it to you in the exact same way that the Bhikkhuni Dhammadina has explained it. Such is its meaning, and so you should remember it. That's what the Blessed One said. The lay follower of Visakka was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. All right. Questions about Nirvana? Deliverance, true knowledge, or ignorance?
or anything else we talked about tonight? Any? <laughs> Deliverance. Yep. So the, the language of deliverance, the, in order to really kind of just grasp that particular Buddhist use of language, you kind of need to be familiar with a certain uh, like Buddhist metaphor. And what it is, is that in Buddhism, they are always talking about the other shore. And the idea is, is, if you haven't heard this lately, the idea is, is that we are on this shore. We're on this side. And this shore, this side, is samsara. On the other shore, over there, is nirvana. Now, the idea is, is that separating samsara, the shore, the, the, the shores of samsara from the green shores of nirvana, separating the two is the sea of transmigration. That's the river that is separating the shores. And the metaphor is basically that when sentient beings, all sentient beings, all forms of life, the idea is, is that when they die, they go into the stream or the river or the flow of transmigration and they get whoop, sucked right back into samsara. So they can't, this is the metaphor, we can't get across, we can't ford the river, and we keep getting sucked in by the river and spat, spat back out into samsara. So what they talk about is entering the stream early. Don't wait until you die. Enter the stream now and start fording your way across. Now, this is where the metaphor of the boat comes in, the yana. That Buddhism is a raft, it's a boat, it's a yana. And they've got hinayanas and mahayanas and vajrayanas, all kinds of yanas. But the point is, is that the boat is to take you to the other shore, to nirvana. And that process can be called deliverance being delivered to nirvana in that way so that's the answer for deliverance and also nirvana versus samsara cyclical existence versus freedom liberation yeah cool noe Yes, thank you, Michael. Wow, what a wonderful read. Oh, thank you so much. My pleasure. Something that goes back a little bit was that idea of, of the pleasure in a previous sutra in this book, the, the where the Buddha says, you might think that I'm still bothered by things, but I go in seclusion because I enjoy it. <laughs> I enjoy being in the here and now rather than some, you know, that I could go on. But that that spoke to this, this spoke to that again always the idea of where voidness emptiness mm. perfect <laughs> thank you thank you noe your your comment reminds me of um it kind of of, of a personal realization i had many 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 years ago that's along exactly the lines of what noe just mentioned and basically what it was is I, I kind of had this realization, how can I put it simply? It was the realization that, that Buddhas, Buddhas don't meditate to get enlightened. They meditate because they are enlightened. 
And that kind of is the same idea of what Noe just said in terms of, no, you don't, that's the sweet spot. I'm not, I'm not trying to get away. That's where I'm trying to get to. Yeah. So wonderful. All right, everybody. So that's going to conclude our little Chula Vidala Sutta, the shorter discourse on questions and answers. Um, who knows what's next? We'll fi find out next week. Um, my guess is we're going to keep moving through the Majima Nikaya. I've been having a good time discovering little things in here. So I don't know if it'll be 45. Maybe, maybe not. We'll find out.